Hi, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Matt Dowling serving the 51st Legislative District in Fayette and Somerset counties. Today uh, we are at the Wagner's Sugar Shack with Jeremy Walters. Uh, Jeremy, thanks for having us here today. Uh, I know this uh, camp has quite a history, uh, but it's new to you. Yes, it is. And first of all, thanks for, uh, for stopping by to, to see our operation. Uh, I'm the, the owner as of uh, about the last year, but the sugar camp has, has been here uh, and part of the Wagner family since the 1880s. And actually, prior to that, it was also an operating sugar camp uh, belonging to the Wilhelm family, dating back to the Civil War era. Now, I know if you're from Somerset County, you're probably pretty familiar with what a sugar camp is, but um, I hate to say it, some of my constituents in Fayette County may have no idea what we're talking about when we talk about a sugar camp. So tell me uh, what type of an operation this is. Yeah, and actually sugar camp is kind of a, a Somerset County term. If you get out of Somerset County, a lot of times they're called sugar houses or, uh, or different terms. But what we do is, this is our, our production facility uh, to, to make maple syrup. Maple syrup is simply made by tapping a tree, drilling a hole in it, collecting the sap, and boiling it down into, into maple syrup. There's no ingredients added. It's a, it's a pure natural product, and that's what the sugar camp is. It's the, it's the place where we make the, the syrup. Now, right now, we are in the, uh, the season where we're collecting sap. Uh, it's a pretty good year so far? We've been fortunate. The past three years have been pretty tough, but the weather has cooperated really well for us so far this year. Uh, we generally need like freeze and thaw cycles. Uh, freezing at night, warm during the day, that creates a pressure inside of the tree that forces the, the sap out. So we've been fortunate. We've been having those freeze thaw cycles and it looks like it's going to be a pretty good season. It's, it's, uh, it's not over yet. I'm hoping to get a couple more weeks yet and it's hard to say what we're going to get exactly, but it looks like it's it's going to be a good season. Well, I know at this historical camp, you have a number of artifacts or some uh, uh, some older things that have been collected over the years. I we know uh, the industry uh, from touring the camps before has really gone through kind of a a. Uh, a revolution recently uh, using things like reverse osmosis, but you still pay homage, I know, to many of the ways that this was done originally. So I think right. maybe we could head inside and look at some of those items and you could explain to us a little bit more about the history of, uh, of how maple syrup was made in Somerset County. Okay, sounds great. Let's go. Well, I know um, the ways the sap is collected has really changed over the years. In fact, you guys have new collection lines that I noticed when we were pulling in. Uh, and when you're traveling throughout Somerset County, I know we see uh, a lot of this type of line that is collecting sap tree to tree. Um, but there is quite a history of how it was manually done. And right. you have some um, great pieces here that kind of show the history of, uh, of collection. So why don't you show us what you got? Okay, yeah, first of all, kind of starting out, this, this trough here is the oldest piece we have. Uh, in the early 1800s and prior, uh, that trough was set on the ground and a wooden spile was inserted into the tree and the sugar water actually dripped into that trough and the, the sugar makers would go around and, and collect the water out of the trough, uh, which was you know, a lot of work back in the day. Uh, then, uh, like the mid 1800s, the wooden keeler uh, became the popular way and the most uh, uh, widely used way to gather the sugar water. And these keelers were, were made by coopers and they were hung on the trees and uh, each day the sugar maker would go and, and gather the sugar water from the keelers. Uh, that was used pretty widely up until like the 1940s. Uh, 1940s, the, the galvanized keeler uh, became more widely used. The wooden keelers were a lot more work because you had to soak them every spring and, and get the wood to swell up in order for them to, to seal. So the, the galvanized keeler bucket was, was quite an improvement over the wooden keelers. Uh, and as representatives said, uh, the, the, uh, the plastic tubings, the the most modern way to uh, produce the uh, and collect the sap now 
it's replaced the this galvanized keeler buckets. Now, in addition to the buckets which were used for collection, I know you kind of alluded to this, on the, uh, on, on the flexible tubing, you have this plastic spile. Mm -hmm. um, I know you have a, a great example here of a wooden spile. Yeah. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit how that would have been used uh, in the original collection and production? Yeah, this was the piece that was actually inserted into the tree. So they were typically made of elderberry because elderberry is really easy to hollow out. So they would, they would cut the elderberry, dry it out, hollow out the center, and then this was used year after year to collect the sap uh, into the trough and the, uh, the wooden keeler buckets. Okay, let's talk about some of the other uh, items you have here on display. Okay, all right. Now we've been talking a lot about the collection of the maple syrup that comes out of the trees uh, and I understand that you have a very interesting and maybe uh, even historic wagon that I think was used in that process. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, the original Wagner that bought the farm was William Wagner and he was a cooper by trade uh, which means he meant uh, or he manufactured wooden uh, buckets and keelers and gathering tanks and this is one of the original gathering tanks that he made in the 1880s and it was used on the farm to gather the sugar water uh, up until about the 1950s whenever they replaced the wooden gathering tank with a, a more modern galvanized tank. Now this would have been horse drawn? Yes it was horse drawn. We've got, uh, got some other neat pieces. Uh, here we have a wooden sugaring trough and this this was used um, frequently in the 1800s the Wagner family here used this up until like the 1970s but before uh, like metal syrup cans became readily available syrup was mostly made in the sugar so they would heat the syrup up to about 260 degrees put it in this wooden trough and then he'd stir it until it became sugar. So the sugar was easier to store than, you know, because they didn't have access to the metal cans. And it became a real stable product then. It at that was, point it in was time. shelf stable. And whenever they wanted syrup, they just simply mixed water with the sugar and it turned back into and, and syrup. you had your syrup. Yeah. You can also, um, you know, use that sugar in your baking. Oh if, yeah. You know, uh, to substitute instead of regular uh, white sugar. Absolutely, it's uh, it's healthier than than the refined white sugars. Uh, uh, less calories per tablespoon per unit, uh, and it's you know it's it's a more natural product. Now uh, you have a picture right behind you of the old sugar camp and uh, and the next sugar camp. Why don't you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, the, the top picture there is a picture of the farm taken in the 40s. And uh, you can see the, the horse team and all the wooden keeler buckets are set outside. And Mr. Wagner uh, is, is in the front of the picture cleaning out the keeler buckets and getting ready to hang them on the trees. Uh, the next picture down is of the camp that was built in about 1958, a, a cement block structure and uh, that, that structure still stands on the farm here today. Uh, the modern camp, uh, or the more modern camp that we're in right now, this, this building was built in the early 1980s. Now, uh, before we head out, because we're, we're going to be visiting another camp today and learning a little bit more about the actual production, but I wanted to take a look at some of the items you have for sale here, some of the products that you make from the maple. Um, so why don't we head out to the showroom and uh, you can explain some of the products that you sell here. Sounds great. Now we were already talking a little bit about the maple sugar and the process that was used and can still be used to uh, make maple sugar, but I see that that's a product you have for sale right here um, from, uh, from Wagner's. Uh, you have some other products as well uh, that I was hoping maybe you'd tell us about. This is your pure maple syrup. Yes. So tell us a little bit about this product. Well, there's, there's several different grades of maple syrup uh, based on color and flavor. Uh, so this is, this is the first product that comes off the evaporator. Whenever we, we harvest the sugar water from the trees, the sap from the trees, we, we run it through the reverse osmosis, boil it down, and, and it turns into syrup. Now all the other um, products that we have are made from the syrup. So like I say, the, the syrup is the first, first step of the process. 
Okay, and you have a number of different uh, display options that uh, you can purchase either in, in we these do. very nice glass jars. I see you have some tins. You also have uh, the Somerset County bottles where uh, people can know where their, their maple syrup comes from. I know you have some items made from syrup here in this uh, little refrigerator. One of my favorites, or my absolute favorite, is uh, the maple cream. Okay. Um, so I know that's a, a great item that uh, that can be used. Tell me a little bit about some of the other items in here. Well, um, the, the maple nuts uh, are basically uh, nuts that are coated in the maple sugar. Uh, the sugar cakes and the cream, they're 100% pure maple. Okay. Um, they're made by heating the syrup to uh, specific temperatures and then going through cooling and stirring processes uh, to turn the syrup into the sugar cakes or the cream. Now, are you uh, available year round for people to purchase your products? Uh, maybe not here at the camp, but online? Yeah, we, we have a, a website, uh, wagnersmapleproducts.com. And we all also have set hours during March and the beginning of April here at the sugar camp. That way, if customers want to stop by for a tour or you know, pick up their, their favorite maple product, they can. Okay. Well, hey, thank you for having us out today and for talking a little bit about the history of uh, maple syrup and the collection of maple syrup here in Somerset County. Uh, it was great talking with you. Thank you. We are now at Milroy Farms and I am with uh, Jason Blocker, uh, the proprietor of, uh, of this sugar shack, of this establishment. I am, yes. And um, we have been talking with a couple different producers in the area today uh, about the history of um, maple syrup and the collection of, uh, of, of syrup and, and how, uh, how it goes through different phases to be turned into some of the delicious things that you sell here at Milroy Farms and some of the other uh, locations around the county. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, what size farm are you? How much do you produce? Um, and do you know any of the statistics about Somerset County? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, statistics about Somerset County. There is more syrup produced in Somerset County than any place else in Pennsylvania. There are five maple producing associations within the state of Pennsylvania. Somerset Maple Producers Association being the southernmost. We produce the most syrup in the state because we're sitting on the highest point in Pennsylvania. So we're all sitting surrounded, you know, Mount Davis. Um, and that gives us the climate that the sugar trees prefer. So they prefer a, a cold, damp climate. And that's, that's the reason. Um, as far as ourselves, um, we are one of the larger producers in the county, not the largest, but uh, we're, we're in the top tier of, of producers. Um, the county association, if my memory serves me right, because I'm a director with them, we have 70 couple members in the association itself. Okay, well, here you have some great examples of, of how uh, the production takes place, so I was hoping maybe we could walk over into the other room and uh, talk a little bit about the process of uh, reducing the water content and getting syrup to uh, what we like to put on our pancakes. Sure, be glad to show you around. Let's head on over. This is probably one of the biggest game changers in maple production in the last 30 years. This is reverse osmosis. This machine will remove about 75% of the water out of the sap before it actually goes to the evaporator. To do so, the sap passes through these membranes under high pressure. This is a cross section of the membrane. The membranes are woven, the material is dense enough that the sugars will not pass through it, but the pure water will. So under pressure, the pure water will pass to the center core, exit the machine. The sugars are then concentrated. We take that concentrate 
and then pump it to the evaporator to produce syrup. Um, this is just a cross section. This is actually one of the membranes themselves. So this is in the reverse osmosis Yeah, and there's machine. four of those membranes in this machine. This machine can process about 2,000 gallons of sap per hour. Now, if you know the history of maple, in Somerset County, we average about 2% sugar content. That means it takes about 43 gallons to produce a gallon of syrup. If we run it through this machine and remove about 75% of the water, then it's only going to take about 10 gallons to produce a gallon of syrup. So it saves a lot of time, a lot of fuel and man hours in the sugar house. And we're going to look at the evaporator here in just a moment, um, but basically this is cutting down drastically the amount of time that you would have to cook uh, the water yes. off. Yeah, so it, it helps give a better quality of syrup because the sap is not boiling, not on the fire, as long as it normally would be by having a concentrated sap to begin with. Well, let's walk over and take a look at the evaporator. We can do that. And now we are looking at the evaporator. So at, tell us a little bit about this unit and how it works. Yeah, at the evaporator, what's known in the maple industry is what we call the rig. Um, this evaporator is five foot in width, 16 foot in length. The back part of it is actually a flue pan where the water sits in channels. It is three times the surface area that were for a flat bottom pan. So greater surface area, greater heat exchange, greater rate of evaporation. Um, if you notice down inside, you can see the sap boiling. It's a continuous flow. So as you see in this pocket, we're continuously feeding sap in. The thinner sap will push the denser ahead through the system. <clears throat> so when it comes out of the back pan, out of our flue pan, it moves into the front pan, which is referred to as the syrup pan. When it gets to this point, it's dense enough, thick enough, it won't move through a flue system without burning. So this is a flat bottom pan. Now here, the sap has to travel to one end of the pan, through an opening in the divider, to the back of the pan. The whole time it is boiling off more water, evaporating more water, becoming denser, till we get to this side, and then this is where we are actually drawing syrup off the evaporator. To t check it, we use both hydrometer, which works on specific gravity, and the density of the syrup. So the higher the sugar content, the higher this will float. Um, and we use a temperature control draw off, and it's just about to open and draw syrup automatically. Now this works on temperature, so it's affected by air pressure. Sure. So we constantly check with a hydrometer to move our temperature up or down to keep our density correct. Give it just a second here. It should draw some syrup. Then we catch the dipper full of syrup, float our hydrometer in it, and that's floating at about 31 degrees in the Baume scale. Finished syrup is 32. Okay. We take about a degree light here. Um, because we retail everything we can produce, we don't finish to precise syrup on the evaporator. It's too hard to control. We actually go through a finish step. Okay. And then we'll finish in a batch process um, just so we have a greater quality control. Well, let's take a look at, uh, at the area you finish in, and I know there's also a press you use yes. in one of your final steps. Yep. So let's it's head out that way. Room. Now, I, I know you said that you uh, prefer to finish off in smaller batches. We do. And you do that in this room. In, in this pan, so the syrup you saw on the evaporator is actually being pumped into one of the holding tanks. Then from there, later today, we will put it about 30 gallon at a time in this pan, finish it over a controlled heat. So when we get the exact density that we want, again, checking with hydrometer, we simply turn the burner off, stop the evaporation. Now, because we have evaporated so much water, the mineral remains. 
Okay. So the mineral partially adheres to the sides of the evaporator, much like your coffee pot, your teapot at home. The other part of it goes into what's referred to as a sand, and it stays suspended in the syrup. So syrup off the evaporator is very cloudy. Now what you see in that making it cloudy is just suspended mineral. This unit is our filter press. So we take a felt paper like this that goes between each of the plates. Then the plates are threaded together. The syrup is pushed through these papers at excess of 200 degrees. So what this will do is give the syrup its clarity will not change the color, but will give it its clarity by removing the mineral content. Um, for example, this is the same syrup. And it removes any of that cloudiness it that exists the there. There's nothing harmful in the, in the cloudiness syrup. It's just mineral content. But what will happen over time, because it's heavy, it will settle to the bottom of the container that if you package for retail sale, whoever gets the last of the syrup on their pancake is going to get more of a gritty substance. A little grit with it. A little grit with it. So, you know, you want to package a high quality product, so you want to remove that mineral out of it. And, and just the look, especially if you're going to bottle that in something glass, yes. is a huge, much, huge much more difference. appealing. Well, I know earlier uh, in the afternoon when we first arrived, you were making some candies out mm -hmm. in the retail space, sure. out in the kitchen. I'm going to go out and see how those turned out and then uh, talk a little bit more about Milroy Farms and, uh, and the history and your family. Uh, so let's head out there to the retail yep, space. Yep, the candy should be cool by now. So it looks like the candies have cooled off. They've cooled, they're now ready to take out of the mold. So we take the rubber molds, put them on the rack, and then we just press out the individual candy. On. Those look delicious. Fresh, on out of the mold. Mm. Those are a fantastic candy. Now, we were talking um, a little bit off camera about this year's season and the quality of the season, the type of temperature you've had. Um, tell me a little bit about how this year's season compares to the last couple. This season, for one, is back to close to a normal season. So we're back to actually have started our season mid part of February, latter part of February. Um, some producers are actually boiling for the first time this week. So that's normal. Um, the last three or four years with the warm weather conditions, we've started earlier and earlier. Last year, we actually made syrup in January. We made our last syrup in April, which you would think stretched out that long is a really good season. It was not. It was just a long season. It wasn't necessarily a good season. Um, ideally, what we want are weather conditions with highs in the 40s, lows in the 20s. So we get that freeze thaw cycle. Um, and that's what we're getting now. Also, the last couple of years, our sugar content has been low. And surprisingly, to everybody's surprise this year, our sugar content has come back to about average. Um, with as wet a summer as we've had and as little sunshine as we had the past year, nobody expected sugar content to be anywhere close to what it is now. So we've been surprised with that. Whether that holds for the rest of the season or not, that's up to Mother Nature. We'll know for sure in April. Now I know, um, and, and we've been talking a little bit about how the technology has changed in the industry itself. Uh, I know you're monitoring things out in the woods constantly. We are, yeah. Um, technology's catching up 
with the maple business like all industry. Um, about four years ago, we put a monitoring system in that looks at our vacuum levels and looks at our tank levels. And I guess I should explain that to increase the flow of sap and the amount of sap that we get from a tree, we put vacuum on the tubing lines. So we don't necessarily pull the sap out of the tree, but you get your best sap flow in a natural low air pressure condition. By applying vacuum to the lines and vacuum to that tap hole, we're creating an artificial low air pressure. So typically that tap hole will produce two to maybe two and a half times as much sap under vacuum is what we would get out of a gravity condition. Um, so we're getting more sap out of the same tap hole with no more damage to the tree. And the tree can supply that much more sap to us without being detrimental to its health. And that monitoring system now, of course, like, like all things, um, technology has made it a lot easier uh, on you. You're not running out in the middle of the night, night. but you can look at your cell phone and or screen in, in one of the many rooms here at the shack. Yeah, I, I use my cell phone the most. Um, last night, for example, at 10 o'clock, the trees were still running very well. Um, I was expecting that by about two or three o'clock in the morning, I was going to have to go empty some of our tanks to keep them from overflowing till morning. Um, when I woke up in the middle of the night, simply rolled over and looked at my cell phone, I could see that the temperatures had dropped enough and I could see that my tank levels were not near being full. So there was no need to crawl out of bed in the middle of the night and I could get a couple more hours sleep. That's no. very beneficial in some oh, sugar seasons. Absolutely, <laughs> I, I, I could tell. Now, um, you know, I see uh, that your farm, Milroy Farms, is celebrating over 75 years. Over 75 years, yeah. And the name Milroy actually came from my grandparents. So my grandparents bought this farm in 1942. When they did, they had to name the farm. So my family name is Blucker. The farm name is Milroy because my grandmother was Mildred and my grandfather was Roy. So that, that's where our farm name came from. And that's, that served us very well over the years. And so I'm third generation on this farm. If I go through my grandmother's lineage, and she was a Wagner from the Wagner camp in West Salisbury, I have five generations of maple production in my, in my blood, in my history. Now, I know you sell a lot of your products or all your products direct to retail, whether it be a candy, whether it be um, your syrups, is there a website that people can we order do. from? Um, we have milroyfarms.com. Um, so you can look on our website, you can call us, you can email us. Um, and we ship almost every day that we're shipping product out to somebody in the country. Um, we will ship worldwide. It just gets expensive shipping when you leave the sure. continental U.S. Sure. Well, hey, thanks for spending time right. with us. Thank, Thank you. you for we showing us around it. today. All right. Nice having you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Matthew Dowling. For more information or if you'd like to contact my offices, visit www.repdowling.com or find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Mm -hmm.